Thank you for downloading the BBC Radio 4 Friday Night Comedy Podcast. I'm Miles Jupp, and this week, yes, if you follow the main calendar, you've got it. It's the news quiz. This week we discuss President Trump, Kim Jong-un and Paul Nuttall, my perfect dinner party. Kim is an absolute beast at charades. So please sit, stand, squat or indeed forward roll whilst enjoying this week's edition of the News Quiz. We present the News Quiz with your host, Miles Jupp. Hello and welcome to the News Quiz. We start with an item spotted on the Poynton News and Gossip Facebook page, read by Cathy Clugston. I've just been out to rescue yet another bin that had blown over on Chestnut Drive in the windy weather. Please help by checking bins for older residents. <laughs> Our thanks to Christy Beek for sending that in. Now, let's meet the teams. Will you welcome first, on my right, Jeremy Hardy and Gina Yashere. And opposite them, on my left, Romesh Ranganathan and Simon Evans. Jeremy, whose post is no longer secure? It's more Trump, isn't it? <laughs> Joy. It's the forced resignation of, of Michael Flynn, National Security Advisor. People keep saying to me, must be good for you lot, you comics, eh, Trump? And you think, do you know what? I mean, I think global takeover of the world by the Russian mafia is a high price to pay for a, <laughs> a few fake tan gags, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I'd settle for hanging up my boots in a sane world. It's not, we do care about stuff, comedians, and it's not as though Hillary Clinton wouldn't have given us anything to work with. I mean, <laughs> we'd have had to work harder sifting through the sort of mire of routine neoliberal venality and torturing imperialism to find little nuggets of mirth, but we'd have done, <laughs> we'd have done our satirical duty. But it's hard for us because... This show records on a Thursday, which means that we are like Kellyanne Conway, at least 24 hours behind the events that we're trying to explain. Because <laughs> for her, she's like... Um, she's like... It's like an improv game where she's got to justify something and guess what it is. <laughs> She's being interviewed and she's going, uh, uh, the president has full confidence in Mike Pence. Not Mike Pence, not Mike Pence, uh, Michael, Michael Flynn, Michael Flynn. And she's got so much confidence that he, he's resigned. It was too much confidence for one man, too much. Is there some sort of, like, really good... What's a severance package like for president? Because I wonder if Trump, like, if he gets fired, he gets a lot more money than if he quits, because it's like he's trying to get sacked. Like, I think he's just trying to push it as far as he can, do you know what I mean? Like, what, have you been... You live in America, Gina. Have you been there recently? I mean, it, I'm trumped out. It's just tiring. Because it's every day, it's just like... Oh, God, what has he done now? It's every day it's a different thing. I just think he's bombarding us with craziness so that when he does decide to pull the trigger, whatever that is, we'll just go, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's just how oh, it's him. Oh, all right. Now, Simon, uh, which side are you on? Well, I, I find myself slightly torn, Miles, uh, because I, obviously I have been invited onto this show as the, you know, the voice of the right wing. I am the, uh, <laughs> one of the more right wing members of this panel, but some will go so far as to say Blairite. Yeah. Uh, so far, <laughs> I do feel it falls to me to defend Trump. I, f I find our attitude to Trump intriguing in this country. Look at the facts. He denounces the mainstream media. He has risen to power through presenting a series of failed economic measures which are superficially attractive to the perfectly reliable and understandable blue-collar grievances. And within a few days of entering office, he is being destabilised by his own intelligence forces. He is essentially a natural ally of the hard left in this country, and I... <laughs> I mean, he's only a cardigan and a walking stick away from being Michael Foote, essentially. <laughs> I think is you've got to remember when you're dealing with Trump seriously, what you're dealing with in America is if you want to try and persuade the people who put him there that they did wrong, that they made an error, you've got to understand they, they don't like, they're not interested in the politics, they support him like a football team. If you're a Chelsea fan and Chelsea win a match despite getting three red cards for career-ending fouls on opposition players, nobody goes, well, that's it with me and Chelsea, I've had it, I don't like them. They go, we did it with nine men! We still won! And this is how they seem Trump at the moment. Yeah, they just think he's winning despite all these catastrophic errors and failings. He's still winning, and so they're loving it. That analogy would only work if you'd never supported Chelsea before, but because they suddenly bought an orange lunatic to play for them. 
you suddenly started supporting well, them, having no knowledge or interest in football. People have started supporting Chelsea because it's drenched with Russian money. I mean, so there is a, there is a, a degree of I think the analogy with Michael Foote is slightly unfair. <laughs> Given that if an, if on, one of Michael on Foote's neighbours had said, would you mind looking after the cats while we're away, they would have felt entirely that they could trust Michael <laughs> Foote to look after the cats. <laughs> were it Donald Trump, you think the cat is either going to be dead or pregnant when we're going to get <laughs> Hayley, these are the latest goings-on in that wonky-wheeled shopping trolley full of flaming skulls that is the Trump administration. <laughs> General Michael Flynn resigned on Monday after it was revealed that he'd lied about discussing sanctions with the Russian ambassador. This made it impossible for him to continue as national security adviser, although in fairness to Flynn it's possible no one had told him which nation he was supposed to be making more secure. <laughs> Michael Flynn is a retired three-star general, which the Americans think is something to be applauded, yet in the UK three stars normally means passable continental breakfast, yet steam room has distinct whiff of urine. <laughs> Trump said that Flynn had been treated very unfairly, and he's right, it's very unfair to accuse someone of treason based on only the weak and misleading evidence of things that they've literally said and done. <laughs> Two points to Jeremy. Gina, who's careering into trouble again? So on Monday, um, Kim Jong-nam, who is the brother of King Jong-un, was killed in an airport in Malaysia. Uh, some women apparently approached him and sprayed some sort of liquid in his face and basically everybody's assuming, I think we can all safely assume that that was his younger brother that had something to do with it. That's basically what the story is. I hope you is. can safely assume that. It's very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say safe. All right, true. <laughs> Certainly wouldn't say it out loud in a public yeah. forum. All right, so, that's true. All right, for the, for the sake of uh, Kim Jong-il, my name is Whoopi Goldberg. So... <laughs> So it was, and it was his younger brother that he and the and the uncle he yeah. had machine gunned by a firing squad. Families, eh? <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to figure out why it was it's happened now. And they're sort of talking about I was reading about the sort of stuff he's got up to. And his ultimate low point, apparently, what's really angered the whole family, all of the Kims, <laughs> is that he tried to sneak into Disneyland, <laughs> like in Tokyo, which I don't think is a low point. <laughs> But and apparently he was trying to defect to South Korea. Well, the rumour is trying to defect to South Korea. Well, he, he, he was already... I mean, he was living in exile for ten years. Mm. So yeah, but he it's... wasn't... He was supposed to be living in exile, but his Facebook profile, he's got loads of photos of just, like, just trying to get into Disneyland, hashtag good times. Do you know what I mean? It's like... <laughs> I think he's just seeking attention. He's letting off missiles over Japan at the same time as Japanese was meeting Trump and then killing his brother. I think he's just like that annoying kid who's trying to pick a fight. He's like, look, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Look what I've done. <laughs> <laughs> I think he does want to sort of pack as much as possible into a sort of one week. It's no point, isn't he? Like, he works on a sort of week on, week off. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, do, I do sort of see where he's coming from a little bit. I think... Yeah, yeah. If no, it's... Sure, we all, we all empathise. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I tell you human. why, because yeah. his brother was trying to defect to South Korea. I sort of get it. You're North Korean, mate. Don't defect. If my brother started supporting Tottenham, I reckon I'd have him done. <laughs> <laughs> Not in an airport. I'd give him some dignity, but maybe, <laughs> maybe in a park or something. But <laughs> he would have been if it hadn't been for the strange sort of Disneyland saga. He was mm. this one, Kim Jong Nam. He would have become the leader after when Kim Jong Il died. So it's quite a sort of fall from. Imagine place. that. How much have you got to like Mickey Mouse? <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me of an essay I wrote uh, at school where I thought the Crusades took place immediately after Jesus's death. There was at least <laughs> ten years between the point at which he tried to go to Disneyland and was thus disinherited from the hereditary rule of, and the recent assassination. He was not assassinated on the way to Disneyland. <laughs> it is important to put that ten-year gap right. in there to, 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 to separate Sorry, those so two events out. When I, um, <laughs> when I first heard the story, the news reporter described the weapon that was used as a poison-laced cloth, but I misheard it and I thought it was a poisoned lace cloth. And I thought, oh, that's fine, it's a sort of decorative touch of class. <laughs> <in> the... <laughs> You know this thing like, that apparently the, the, the woman that did it instigated it. She thought it was a prank or something like that. Like, I don't know what kind of prank it is, but apparently the actual killers were sort of around her and it, yeah. it was sort of like they'd set her up and they said, wouldn't it be funny if... You see that guy that's trying to get into Disneyland? Wouldn't it be funny? <laughs> it 
is, I mean, it would Russia be possible story, to get people yeah. to assassinate people using that kind of approach, I imagine. The same, you know, as uh, the 11 o'clock show used to trick old ladies in the street into saying bum, didn't they, on the radio. You know, you go, ha, 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 she doesn't realise she's just said bum. And uh, <laughs> if you could convince people to just hold up a, a handkerchief <laughs> under somebody's nose and kill them, that would be a really good way of yeah. and, concealing... Yeah, and also, as she puts a handkerchief over, say bum. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. She doesn't realise she's killed him and she said bum. <laughs> Metonymically, these are the latest antics of North Korea, a country whose national motto is you don't have to be mad to rule here, but it helps. <laughs> in the course of a single bonkers week, they launched a new long-range nuclear missile before being implicated in the assassination of Kim Jong-un's estranged half-brother, news that has been filling the front pages of the fearless investigative North Korean newspapers that simply don't exist. <laughs> Exile Kim Jong-nam was attacked at Kuala Lumpur Airport by what news website Asian correspondent described as lady assassins. Now, in my book, once you've murdered someone in cold blood using a poison more toxic than cyanide, you have ceased to be a lady. Um, <laughs> always been my view, can't start making exceptions now. <laughs> they don't have a programme like the news quiz in North Korea. The nearest equivalent to this in North Korean media is six hours of non-stop synchronised dancing. And I wish I could tell you it's less entertaining than what we have to offer. Two points <laughs> to Gina. Uh, Ramesh, who's been stoking a controversy? Uh, this is uh, Paul Nuttall, leader of UKIP, who is standing uh, in stoke in the by-election. And he has had to... Well, he's had to withdraw comments from his website. He said that he had very close friends that died in the Hillsborough tragedy, and then it turned out that he didn't. And then he said, actually, what I meant was somebody I know was at Hillsborough, and, and then we don't know if that's true. And now what he said is, actually, I, all I said was I can spell Hillsborough. Um, <laughs> it, it's sort of, is what it turns out he meant. But it, it just, he, he's basically got caught out. It turns out he didn't have close friends there. It was on his website, that's where they source the information. So now his website is closed down for scheduled maintenance. I don't know how it's scheduled. <laughs> just the schedule is every time he gets caught out lying, mm -hmm. they have to <laughs> close it down for maintenance. But he sort of told, he'd done a lot of lies. He said that um, he played up front for Tramir Rovers. That turns out to be a lie. Um, <laughs> He said that he got a history PhD in 2004, that turns out it's a lie. He said he lives in Stoke, apparently that's a lie. He said that now that Brexit's happened, they're still a point to UKIP. Turns out that was a lie. <laughs> Jimmy, that's... He is quite imaginative, isn't he? I mean, he has been trying to make some connections. He says, I, I have lived in Stoke-on-Sea all my life. <laughs> I, I am 200 years old, and I was on the plane with Buddy Holly. It's like when you go to parents' evening and you find out what your child has been saying. <laughs> oh, sorry to hear about your house being destroyed by aliens. We've been hearing all of that. No, no wonder she's been so late with her homework. We, we've been, we're all very sorry in the staff room. No, I mean, the problem they've got is just that um, it's really important that he wins this. I mean, UKIP are saying that they're replacing Labour. And so it really is essential that he does win this, and he's in a bit of trouble. Um, Gareth Snell, who's standing for Labour, has also got into trouble, the Labour candidate, because they've trawled through his Twitter and found that a few years ago he was watching loose women and described them as sour-faced women or something like that. You know, the fact that he's watching loose women... <laughs> I think probably makes his position untenable. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he also said some horrible things about The Apprentice, about some specky cow or something like that. So now he's in trouble as well. So everyone's sort of trying their best to lose. I don't know if you saw this thing about a Muslim Labour supporter who sent uh, WhatsApp messages and text messages to all of the Muslims in the area saying, if you don't vote for Labour, you are going to go to hell. And I thought, well, I mean, you are already in Stoke. <laughs> <laughs> Hypnotically, this is the glitz and glamour of next week's Stoke-on-Trent central by-election. Just six more sleeps to go. <laughs> UKIP candidate Paul Nuttall was this week forced to admit that he had not lost close personal friends in the 1989 Hillsborough disaster. However, Nuttall continues to insist he had been present at the match, claiming that if you examine the video footage, you can clearly see him playing in central midfield under his then, <laughs> then given name of Peter Beardsley. <laughs> In the interests of fairness, we should point out that we have seen nothing to disprove Nuttall's claims to have been a passenger on the Hindenburg and to have lost close personal friends at the Battle of Bosworth Field. <laughs> also in the Stoke Central campaign, there was embarrassment for Labour candidate Gareth Snell, a name destined, if not for high office, then at least an illustrious career in middle management. <laughs> 
Snell has been accused of tweeting sexist comments about The Apprentice and loose women. But this is nothing new for the Labour Party, who could forget Clement Attlee's comments to the 1947 party conference that Gracie Fields was something of a trout, and that Joyce Grenfell should stop performing a series of amusing monologues and get back in the kitchen where she belongs. <laughs> Clearly, Snell's plan is to alienate women first before joining the rest of his party and broadening this out to the remainder of the electorate. <laughs> Two points to Ramesh. And at the end of round one, the scores are Jeremy and Gina have four, and so too do Ramesh and Simon. <laughs> we start round two with an extract from an interview with actor Stephen McGann in the Sunday Express magazine. When I was 13, I was very shy. My first kiss was with a girl at a bus stop. My knees were trembling so much, I couldn't get up to the top deck. <laughs> Thanks to Anne O'Leary in Silverdale in Staffordshire for sending us that. Simon, who's given a synod and a wink to a marriage proposal? Ah, OK, the, the general uh, synod, the, uh, the sort of administrative body that rules the Church of England. They are discussing the minutiae of same-sex marriage now and whether or not it should be celebrated in church and a, a report was produced which said that it should not be uh, officiated over and celebrated and um, and this was approved by the bishops there was a clean sweep across the board by the a, a diagonal sweep but clean nevertheless um, <laughs> uh, by the bishops and uh, <laughs> and and the house of laity uh, who i'd not be uh, exclusive to netflix i believe the house of laity but um, <laughs> they voted it through as well but the clergy uh, who actually work at the coalface of the Church of England, the clergy, and who are terrified that the provisional wing of Anglican liberalism will be activated and will bake a really angry cake uh, about this if they're not careful, have, uh, have said, no, we don't, we want to carry on, we want there to be full same-sex marriages in church. I remember when same-sex marriages were legalised a few years ago, a lot of people said that this would undermine a conventional heterosexual marriage. And actually, I think that has happened. It certainly seems to have undermined mine, or something has, anyway. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I actually tried to find... Like, if you look, I was trying to find the source of this, because it's, it's open to some sort of speculation how much homosexuality is sort of how wrong it is according to the church, because that's pretty much open to interpretation. I wish God would just come down and clear it up. You know, because you sort of think, we are sort of working from a very early version of the Bible, and it hasn't, he hasn't come down and sort of revised it. We're on iPhone 7. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I, I don't know. We're at least sort of due a Bible 4S or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Where God just pops down and says, Do you know what, being gay is all right, and also, there were dinosaurs, just deal with it. Do you know what I mean? Like, this would clear up a lot of confusion. Actually, what's interesting about the, the most conservative people in, in the synod, it's the laity. It's not the clergy, it's the laity. It's the ones who believe in God who are the problem. <laughs> because the clergy, the clergy have a much more pragmatic approach because they have read the stuff. That's the thing. And if, you're, if you are a religious scholar and you spend years poring over this, after a minute you think... Hang on a minute. <laughs> That's not true. Come on. And fittingly, this is the decision of the General Synod of the Church of England to reject a House of Bishops report recommending continued opposition to same-sex marriage, all of which casts a continuing doubt on the Archbishop of Canterbury's efforts to hold the Anglican communion together. The House of Bishops is one of three factions of the Church Synod and also the name of Truro's most popular gay knight. Uh, <laughs> Congrats if you're listening, House of Bishops. I'll be there spinning the wheels of steel on Tuesday, as per rudder usual. Uh, eight hours of Scandinavian death metal and Gilbert and Sullivan in exactly equal parts. Uh, anyway, these conversations make me rather uncomfortable. It makes me glad the only Lord I serve is he of the dance. <laughs> Two points to Simon. Gina, who's benefiting from old money? All oh, right, so that's from <clears throat> this week's news is that um, a study was done which showed that uh, pensioners now, their income has now surpassed working people. Not a huge amount, it's like something like 20 quid a week. It's not a massive difference, but they reckon it's because more pensioners own their own homes and a lot of them have got very good pensions. But obviously, you've got to take into consideration that uh, they were able to buy houses when they were still £12. <laughs> but then the, some people, like my mum's a pensioner, she could retire, but she works because... She doesn't want to be at home in front of the TV. She's bored, and so she carries on doing stuff just to keep herself active, and she's also a greedy bitch, but mostly because... 
<laughs> she doesn't want to be at home bored. I've That's a couple very of friends who are in their 20s and 30s, and they rage about how unfair it is that the older people have, like, homes and food and stuff. But, um, <laughs> but I think, yeah, but you've got your whole life ahead of you. All these cash-rich pensioners, all they have to look forward to is huge amounts of palliative care, mm. bargain hunt and cruises. I mean, I think bargain hunt is grounds for not resuscitating, to be honest. I think they should just bring down the average age of death, like... Is it because... Because... Is you know, something sort of, you think can be done well, by policy alone? Or? Well, I just sort of think, you know... But owning your house, isn't that overrated? Like, you know, because I sort of think, you know, this deal with owning your house so that what? When you die, you can give it to your kids. I don't want my kids... Like, what have they done for it? I, 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 do you know what I mean? I just sort of think, it's overrated. I just rent, and then they get nothing, and they have to make their own way in life. And that's the way, especially the second one. <laughs> <laughs> He's not even yours, that one, is he? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, apparently, Paul Nuttall's a father. So that's what I mean. um, what other good news was there for people in their 80s this week? don't know. Uh, it's a report by uh, Dr David Lee and Professor Josie Tetley from Manchester uh, about the fact that uh, people in their 80s are having more shared sexual compatibility and emotional closeness than those in their 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, he refers to these people as sexual survivors. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah, people in their 80s are having more and better sex uh, than people in their 50s, would you believe? Why is this, Jeremy? Is this the... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm only 55. I just, I just had a bad life. Uh, George Lee, in yet another week that brings great news for the doily industry, this is a report that pensioners are now on average £20 a week better off than working families. This makes complete sense to me, as all the pensioners I know save money by not doing a big supermarket shop and instead eating their main meal at one of the many funerals they attend each week. <laughs> Entirely uninvited. <laughs> the higher income of pensioners is said to be down to their combination of prudent savings, early mortgage repayments, sensible investments, and an intimate knowledge of the Hatton Garden area. <laughs> In other elderly news this week, it was revealed that 80-somethings are now enjoying a better sex life than their 50-something counterparts. So we now know that when you help an old lady across the road, it's because she's on her way to copulate frantically on a bed of money. <laughs> to Gino. <laughs> Rubbish, why will there be less jockeying at the bar? Uh, well, basically, uh, the jockey club have said that people that are attending, you know, like the Cheltenham races or whatever, are getting too drunk and are creating havoc. Uh, and so they've decided that they're going to limit people. They're going to put water points in, bottles of water for everybody. They're going to make it less alcohol-focused. You're only allowed to buy four drinks at the bar or something on there, they're going to limit you to that because there's just been debaucherous, debaucherous, I believe is the word used, behaviour at the races. That so, should work, I reckon, because I, I normally only get drunk when there isn't water available. That's, that's mainly the, you know, yeah. it's, you're only ever really driven. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> the number of times I said, I am absolutely parched. Have you got any water? <laughs> no, tequila then. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I, I mean, I, I sort of... You know, I've got a number of issues with this. First of all, you know, it's a bit of a weird set of rules. You know, horse racing, I personally think, you know, it seems to be that it's OK to have all these animals running, having a guy whipping them on the backside. If they fall and injure themselves, you shoot them dead. Uh, you drug them up before they're doing it. And that's all all right, as long as you're not tipsy while you're watching that happen. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I just think it's a little bit of a, a mixed sort of set of values. And also, the, the way that it's been reported... I'm looking at the photos of these people who are debaucherous, and I just think, that looks like a laugh. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm going to do that well, instead of Magaluf. urinating in a champagne flute. Is, yeah. that, is that the example? It takes a degree of accuracy to get it into a champagne flute. I mean, a, a champagne beer tank flute is surely easy. not big enough, either. That's not... Uh, well, you, you don't have to put your heart... You just try and get... <laughs> no, I'm talking just... about containing, containing the liquid. I'm oh, not making liquid. any kind oh, of... Oh, well, maybe they did one of those towers, you know, like they oh, do... Oh, yes! Where they... <laughs> 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 Stack them all up. <laughs> the steam the... rising slowly from it. Yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, there's lots of horses with their langers out urinating merrily, aren't they? I mean, why, yeah. why, would it, why should it be any different for footballers? Yes, yeah, right. horses right. poo in the street. Why shouldn't we, Jeremy? <laughs> Uh, how else, though, is this unpleasant behaviour? Uh, uh, how many women were being womanly? You know, like they are with their womanliness. Uh, they, I'm, af I'm afraid that they, some of them were exposing themselves. They exposing what? themselves like to Physically, who? not like as uneducated or something. <laughs> <laughs> I've got absolutely no idea how the odds work. <laughs> 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 what, what bits were they showing, Miles? I don't know. I mean, I just, they're just exposing themselves. It's been left, to, I'm afraid, well, my imagination to run right. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine they just very slowly removed everything to a nice sort of sensuous <laughs> backing tube. Has anyone here ever been to the races? I went to Wimbledon Dogs once. <laughs> Did you expose yourself, no. Jeremy? <laughs> it was terrifying. I've never seen so many white people in South London. It was absolutely terrible. You obviously haven't been to Brixton recently. <laughs> still one man selling plantains in the market, although his name is Hugo. Yeah. But, uh... And also, Hugo selling plantains ironically. Uh, it's not quite the same. Neatly, this is the news that the Jockey Club are to introduce new limits on alcohol at next month's Cheltenham Festival to discourage rowdy behaviour. Last year's event was marred by drunkenness and women exposing themselves, and by marred, I mean thankfully enlivened. <laughs> People will now be limited to four pints at a time, and I believe only allowed to expose themselves twice. <laughs> For me, limiting the amount you can drink will just ruin the whole spectacle. If I can't drain a keg of warm Marston's pedigree, how will I pluck up the courage to ask the man if I can pet one of the horses? <laughs> I should point out that it's not the jockeys who are doing the drinking, the size of those guys. It doesn't take much to push them over the edge. If you want to see Willie Carson mounting a commercial waste bin in the belief that it's a two-and-a-half-year-old steeplechaser, it'll cost you half a pint. <laughs> uh, two points to Ramesh. Before we reveal the final scores, has anybody got a cutting that they'd like to share? Gina. Andrew Blythe saw this in the Birmingham Mail. A Birmingham City Council spokesman confirmed that the closure of the restaurant was due to mouse activity, which was ratified on Monday. <laughs> Ramesh. This is from Peter Walter, who saw this in a magazine called Gruff that reported on a group of walkers that had to be rescued. A spokesman for the rescue team said, the party was fit and reasonably well equipped, but not adequately prepared for the conditions they encountered on the ridge. One of the party managed to lose both shoes when they were sucked off in a deep bog. <laughs> Thank you, and now let's take a look at the final score. Ramesh and Simon have seven, but this week's winners are Jeremy and Gina with eight. <laughs> Before we leave you, here is the opening to a report on Women's Hour this week, sent in by lots of people. Good morning. On the programme today, are you in denial about your hearing loss? Or perhaps someone close to you might be. Keep listening. <laughs> and with that, goodbye. Taking part in the news quiz were Jeremy Hardy, Gina Yashere, Ramesh Ranganathan and Simon Evans. In the chair was Miles Jupp and the news was read by me, Cathy Clubstein. The chair's script was written by Sarah Campbell, James Kettle, Ed Amston and Tom Coles, with additional material by Daniel Audrett and Robin Morgan. The producer was Richard Morris and it was a BBC Studios production. Hello. Thank you for downloading and listening to the News Quiz podcast. 1,000 gold stars to you. I'm Angela Barnes, host of BBC Radio 4 Extra's News Jack. Have you listened yet? Give it a go. It's an award-winning topical sketch show written by members of the public. Download it now and thank me later. Anyone can write for News Jack. For more information, head on over to bbc.co.uk slash Radio 4 Extra.